Last time, we saw how Saul's momentous encounter with the risen Lord was to change his life and world history forever. The greatest opponent of the faith in Jesus was to become its most passionate and effective missionary. And today, we find him appearing before the personal representative of the might of Rome itself. Ever on they must have trudged, for mile after weary mile, driven ever onwards to proclaim the good news about Jesus. Until finally the climax, Paphos itself. They must have been thankful to have made it. Today, its port is more given over to pleasure, serving as a small marina and a shelter for fishermen. But in Paul's day, it was a major seaport. He must have been bursting to start preaching here. So here they were at last. Did our weary travellers actually enter the great city of Paphos along this Roman road? Ah, oh, this bit is still awaiting reconstruction. We can be sure that any town that comprised more than one synagogue was a thriving commercial centre. The Jews of the first century were never found in the poor places. And the ruins here in Paphos certainly confirm the city's importance. Paul and his companions must have walked these very streets. The modern lighthouse towers over one of the city's two theatres. This one reconstructed a delightful setting with its superb views over the plain. This magnificent mosaic of Theseus was a later addition to the house of the governor of the island, whom Paul was soon to meet right here. And here's a hypercost used for heating the rooms of the hot baths so favoured by the rich Romans. Well, so much of Roman Paphos still lies deep beneath the surface. What treasures have yet to be unearthed? Paul had certainly chosen an enormously significant city in which to proclaim his news about Jesus. So what sort of reception did they receive in the synagogues here? Again, tantalisingly, Luke doesn't tell us. But there is an old legend that Paul was whipped here. This is the actual pillar to which the locals attach great importance. In one of his letters, which he later wrote to the early believers in Corinth, he mentions how in his travels he was frequently beaten because of his preaching about Jesus. So it's perfectly possible that one of those occasions might well have occurred right here. The locals here in Paphos certainly consider that it did. They've even named their restaurant in commemoration of it. Well, for whatever reason, the arrival of Barnabas and Saul soon came to the attention of the Roman proconsul Sergius Paulus. And he sent for them because he wanted to hear the word of God. But while Sergius was eager to hear them, one of his attendants was not. Elymas, the sorcerer, that's what his name means, and he opposed them, and he tried to turn the proconsul from the faith. But Paul, full of the Holy Spirit, he looked straight at him and he said, you child of the devil and an enemy of everything that is right, I know what you are, you're full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. When will you ever stop perverting the right ways of the Lord? And now the hand of the Lord is on you and you will be blind and for a moment or a while you will be unable to see the light of the sun. Immediately, mist and darkness so came over him and he groped around trying to find someone to lead him by the hand. When Sergius saw this, he was believed because he was amazed at the power of the Lord. Two remarkable things happened here in Paphos as a result of this audience. From now on, uh, it's never Barnabas and Saul, but always Paul and his party. Up to now, it had always been Saul following Barnabas as a loyal and devoted friend. But from now on, as I said, 
it's always Paul and his party. So why should Saul have chosen this moment to adopt his Roman name of Paul? Well, as the first representative of Jesus, before a high official of Rome, he realised that Paul, the Roman citizen, a member of the ruling empire, was a far more powerful force in the world than Saul the Jew. So it was naturally as Paul that he was to face the Roman Empire. One man against the might of pagan Rome. So, from now on, it's no longer the exploits of Saul that we'll be studying, but Paul. In the last but one chapter of the Bible, God says, Behold, I make all things new. Well, as a foretaste of that, he's certainly done that in the life of Paul. The great antagonist has become the great apostle. So, next time, we'll find him setting off with Barnabas to the mainland of what's present-day Turkey. They're about to bring the good news of Jesus to the military capital of the Roman province of Galatia, Antioch in Pisidia itself. And here, Paul's about to make an announcement that will fling wide the door of Christianity to the whole world. I do hope you can be with me. I'll see you then.